I'm here at the Toronto Urban Summit and everyone's heard of waterless cooking. What about waterless buildings? Yeah, I said waterless buildings. I'm talking to... Jeff Bruce, Jeffrey L. Bruce and Company. And you're an American. I am. And you're an expert at waterless buildings. We're going to enjoy this conversation. So tell me about it. Well, the thing you have to understand is that we're under increasing water scarcity and water and water is becoming harder to find as you see this sort of volume of water. We have the opportunity to uh, manage and create water loops within the cities so that we can try to achieve net zero water, which is basically building facilities that are off the grid, that don't rely on the city municipal water system. So how do we do that? Yeah, it good is, question. It's, it's basically looking at capturing and harvesting alternative water solutions, whether that be rainwater or stormwater or gray water that comes out of the building itself and repurposing, matching those with intended use so that we can recycle and reuse these types of waters continuously within a structure and minimize our impact on the water infrastructure system. So give me, a, uh, I know there's different variations of recapturing the water. Give me some specific ones and just kind of run me through that cycle. Well, the one, one that was interesting, there was a, a building in Indianapolis that was a federal building and it had two sump pumps that were taking out foundation water drainage, uh, running 24-7, 360 days a year. And it's a relatively clean water source because it's filtered by the soil. And we were discharging 18 million gallons of water a year into the sewer system to be treated. Uh, it was the equivalent of about a six inch rainfall event every day on that site. So if we can capture that stream and repurpose it and bring it back into beneficial use with the building, there's an enormous reduction of dependency on our water source. There's also a reduction in the treatment and the amount of resources we put into cleaning the water after we're done. So there's each building has a unique signature and footprint to it that requires us to really a custom sort of solutions, whether it's uh, AC condensate, air conditioning condensate, whether it's the water that comes off cooling towers, whether it's black water or wastewater. Each of those have a signature, each of those have uh, certain treatment requirements that we have to look at. And we have to match the intended water sources and their pollutants, the treatment options we have to clean it up, and then what options do we have for beneficial use of that water? Okay, let's look at uh, new building, cons new construction as to compare to retrofit. Well, it's easier with new building construction because you can incorporate or integrate those design solutions. Uh, with retrofit, particularly with like gray water applications, uh, you need a dual plumbing system inside the building. So you need one plumbing system for drainage of black water and one for gray water. And it's very difficult to retrofit existing structures to that. We can look at opportunities, easy opportunities at point of source, but really when you're looking holistically and in integrating water sort of cycles like this, new construction provides a little bit easier uh, adoption. There are some obstacles that are really important. Uh, water is siloed the second it touches something and classified. So to, if it hits the roof of your building, it becomes rainwater. And there's a requirement of how you manage that. If it hits the ground here, it really becomes stormwater. And the regulatory environment sort of takes over. And it's very difficult to repurpose those types of water within the context of the code officials, the building code, the health department. So we've got a lot of work to do to help educate uh, the general public and the building code so that we are more easily capable of adapting our systems to look at repurposing these wastewaters or alternative waters.
How new is this initiative with the Zero Water? Uh, it really comes out of Cascadia's USGBC, the Green Building Council chapter on the West Coast, which has created the Living Building Challenge, which is a futuristic sort of rating system where they're looking at uh, trying to get all buildings net zero energy, net zero water, net zero carbon, uh, and get those totally self-sufficient so that the buildings are restorative, that they're adding more back to the environment than they're act actually extracting. Let's look at the money, follow the money. What's the uh, ROI on such uh, on a typical investment? Obviously, buildings do vary in the type of building. Can you cite an example of someone doing a retrofit and when, uh, when they actually get their money back? Well, it's, it's difficult because when you look at ROIs, uh, there's a lot of benefits we find associated with green infrastructure that there aren't accepted mechanisms to identify the actual financial impacts. Like, we can do a lot with this pool of water to impact climate change and heat island impact. Uh, while intuitively we know that this will make a difference, it's very difficult to run it into an ROI formula where you access and actually fairly compare that sort of balance and strategy to it. What we look at with traditional financing and modeling terms, uh, we're still a little ways away. Uh, some technologies are five to seven. Other larger storage and harvest technologies are maybe 15 years to 20 years in ROI. But uh, I think we underestimate the public value in terms of stormwater polishing, water quality, air pollution, a lot of public benefits. Um, even the, the value of greenery to real estate pricing, apartment rental rates, office rental rates, are really in their infancy in terms of plugging those into traditional ROI numbers. Uh, we're noticing in the states that Class A office space and high-rise residential understand that there's market potential for adopting these green technologies. So we're actually seeing uh, them including these benefits into their performance and understanding that if I design this green facility in this building, that I will have a higher occupancy rating and we can charge higher rents for it. So we're at the really at the start of looking at rebalancing the ROI equation. That, uh, you know, the misnomer is really ROI is a measure of a lot of times regulatory compliance. What is the minimum requirement which is required by me as a developer in order to get this approved and when will I achieve a payback? So if you're looking at minimal, minimum regulatory compliance, a lot of times ROI doesn't value the added value, the public values that we're hopefully gaining from this type of infrastructure. Okay. Well, how can we benefit by understanding more about this? Do you have a website or? Uh, yeah, Jeffrey L. Bruce and Company. Uh, J, it's uh, www.jlbruce.com. Uh, we've done a fairly complete educational seminar through Green Roofs for Healthy Cities, uh, which is greenroofs.org. So you can learn much more about this uh, in a four-hour, more detailed seminar and really look at the opportunities and the possibilities in the future of integrated water. Well, learn quite a bit. Thank you so much. Thank you.